Let me start with our, our really moderator who's helping us think through this panel today. Michael Nakula is the chair of Applied Psychology and Human Development at the Graduate School of Education, University of Pennsylvania. His teaching and research focus on the development of resilience and the promotion of possibility development among low-income children and youth. He is particularly interested in integration of counseling, mentoring, and educational processes in urban schools to create contexts that allow students to thrive in school and during their transition to higher education and career opportunities. He's the co-author of the game-changing book, Understanding Youth, Adolescent Development for Educators. And it's an interesting topic because typically we don't put those things together. So we're encouraged that He's helping us think through this. And then we've got three dynamic young people with us today. And I get excited because this is really what our work is about. At the end of the day, it's, as uh, Marion said yesterday, she said, put the baby in the middle. Well, they're not quite babies, but put the student in the middle. Um, Alexia Lane is a senior at Benjamin Banneker um, Academic High School in Washington, DC. She assists in the planning the annual One Mike Hip Hop Festival at the Kennedy Center through her participation on the Youth Leadership Committee. She's performed at numerous venues, including Atlas, The Ark, and the Kennedy Center. So if you're from DC, these are all kind of the cool places in town. Um, as Alexia considers her post-secondary plan, she is torn between pursuing a degree in speech pathology, sorry, speech pathology versus a communications degree. David Peake is a sophomore and communications scholar at Georgetown University. He's born and raised in Inglewood, a community on the south side of Chicago, where he attended urban prep and all-male charter school. He graduated valedictorian and came to Georgetown University, where he intends to major in justice and peace studies. He is interested in practicing law as a career. Austin Shaw is a senior at Greenberg Sal Salem High School in Southwest Pennsylvania. He's a four sports athlete and participates as a student leader with the Consortium for Public Education in the development of something called EMAPS, Electronic My Action Plan for Success. Maybe he'll tell us what that is. Um, Austin plans to attend college to pursue a degree in business and finance. So with that, I leave you to this panel. Thank you so much. Good morning. What a pleasure to be here uh, and have an opportunity to talk with our students as opposed to about our students. So we'll be hearing uh, a number of things from each of the panelists this morning that have to do with a few concepts that I'd like to highlight um, as perhaps listening guides for us and, uh, and interaction guides for us. And they are engagement, motivation, and student voice. These three concepts are so critical. If you look at the um, optimal development literature right now in adolescence and young adulthood, you'll see some version of these three concepts in all of that work. So the engagement concept goes something like this. What are the activities or pursuits that people engage in that help foster a sense, a deeper sense of motivation to achieve and get better? Right? So what are the types of activities people engage in that, that tend to be most productive for promoting achievement motivation and motivation to succeed in general? And what is achievement motivation? Right? So the, um, perhaps the literature that you're most familiar with is um, that that focuses on mindset that suggests students with um, a mindset oriented toward effort and the belief that their efforts will allow them to succeed are more likely to succeed. Um, there was a, a bit of a discussion yesterday on how murky social science research is, and I couldn't agree with that more. But one of the things we've learned in um, educational research and in human development research is that the mindset one holds towards success is a strong predictor of success down the road. And that mindset work generally goes as follows. If you believe that your success is more, is, uh, more anchored in hard work versus innate ability, 
you're more likely to persist and ultimately succeed. So I think we're going to hear, we're going to hear stories of um, that type of mindset in our discussion today. And finally, student voice. Um, how do engagement and motivation strategies get voiced by students? How do students find their voice, what they feel committed to, enough to articulate and uh, stand up for themselves, stand up for others, and really play a role as um, not just learners, but educational leaders, educational leaders in their own lives and educational leaders in their communities. So we'll hear a little bit about that today. I want to, before we jump into our panel discussion here, I want to um, see if we can get um, a word from Joe Grockmall. Joe, are you in the room? <laughs> Joe, where are you? Could you stand up, Joe? Okay. <clears throat> Joe represents something that we're talking about today. He is a student leader on his team. Um, the, the, the colleagues around the table draw on Joe's expertise to do some of the work they're doing with their district. And that epitomizes what we're working toward with young people, really taking a meaningful, active role as a change agent. Joe, do you want a word before we get going with the panel? What allowed you to participate in this, uh, uh, in this group? Well, I guess I was uh, contacted by the group originally, and to be honest, when you're called into the office of a teacher you've never had before, it truly is a harrowing experience. <laughs> And to be quite frank, a trip to Washington and to be able to go to this wonderful conference was not what I was expecting. But I'm uh, really happy to be here. And I tell you what, it's um, so often today we see where students are uh, unable to voice uh, their concerns or their beliefs or their hopes for the future. And I believe that, um, fortunately, my group was able to bring me along, um, and I'm really happy to be here. But I assure you that even though students don't necessarily always have the opportunities to speak up, it's not for a lack of will. I can assure you that students within all of your districts, I guarantee you there's many students within your districts who would love to have a voice and to have an input um, into the affairs and into what the administration is working on. And, as often as it's cliched that kids are bored by this sort of stuff, I'm intrigued by it. I know there's kids who love this stuff, who want a, a direct say into their education. And um, I, I challenge all of the um, different school groups here to when you go back home and when you start to present to the students and to the teachers what went on here, I, I ask that you look for students who are interested and engaged. And I, I hope you can uh, continue to uh, involve them in future um, work with your group. So thank you. For the record, Joe really is a student uh, in his high school. Uh, he's not an actor we hired to play this role today. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, can you come up and moderate the panel now? Um, I would like to um, get, get right into our discussion with the students. They have so much to share with us today. And I would like, to, perhaps, to begin um, by picking up on a conversation we were having at breakfast. Uh, perhaps as a way of introducing yourself. So we'll, we'll go down the, down the row here, beginning with Austin. Um, I talked about engagement, motivation, and voice, and we were talking about that at the table. Austin, for you, as you tell people who you are a little bit, what has been most engaging for you in your school experience? Well, good morning, everybody. Um, what's been most engaging for me is through my school, I've been able to get opportunities like this. I've been really involved in presenting things such as EMAPS. And EMAPS is a program where students can basically make a profile like Facebook for their teachers to look and see what they're interested in, see what their skills are. So if a student doesn't know exactly what career they want to pursue, but they have skills such as reading and writing, for example, a teacher could say, well, why don't you look into journalism because you're good at reading, you're good at writing, so put two and two together. So through that, I've, been, I've presented that to my whole entire school, all the students in it, the staff, and just that opportunity has engaged me. It's made me become more of a leader, and it's also helped me with public speaking, which I enjoy a lot, so. Thank you. Lexi, how about you? How about you? Good morning. Um, 
I think one of the, what Austin touched on, public speaking. Um, speaking has always been a talent slash passion slash what I'm good at. Um, <laughs> um, I think one of my biggest principles is teamwork, and that's really helped me get to where I am uh, in my education, uh, socially, um, just all over, really. Um, higher achievement uh, really helped me. They provided me with this opportunity to be here today. So they were part, they're a really intricate part of my village that has helped me to get to where I am. So teamwork. Thank you. And David. Good morning, everybody. In terms of engagement, I definitely would say uh, the group of mentors I had and still have to this day, uh, they, they keep me engaged. You know, when I want to give up on Georgetown, because Georgetown is not the easiest school to go to. <laughs> um, you know, they give me good advice. Uh, we were talking about it at the table, you know, it's, it's just the little things that help. Like when they send me emails like, you know, how was your day? Like, how are you doing? How are classes? How is your family? It's, it's just little things like that that, you know, motivate me to, to keep going. And when, like when I see people that, you know, care about me, it, I don't know, it just it motivates me. And it's, it's very encouraging to have people who care and good mentors. David, you mentioned motivation. And um, one of the questions that comes up frequently for students who go through the long process of their elementary school years, middle school years, high school years, and then move into college, uh, there, there are going to be bumps in the road at certain times. And uh, I'm curious what allowed you to, you talked about key people who helped you out. What else did your school do? We have a room full of educators here and people interested in education. What did your school do, um, if anything, that helped deepen your, the motivation that you hold today to continue on with your education? My school, well, of course, like you said, I had a lot of bumps uh, in high school. At a, at a point in time, I actually was homeless. Um, I can honestly say my teachers, like, stepping outside of that academic role, you know, doing more than just teaching me you know, calculus doing more than just teaching me English, you know, um, like actually like going more into like the, the social aspect. I had a couple teachers that, you know, even came to my house to visit me. I had teachers that always checked up on me, and, you know, teachers that were really concerned like outside of academics. So, you know, people being concerned more than, more about the academics than, you know, the social, or having, having that balance, I feel like helps out a lot. How about you, Lexi? Um, with my school, well, my high school is 100% acceptance into college and 100% attendance into college. Uh, Banneker is number one in DC for DC CAS scores and college acceptance and attendance. So we're very go to college and we have <laughs> every instrument in place to make sure that we go to college and not just you know like a little rinky dink oh you got you going to college but a real like four year institution you're going to go to college and then graduate from college um, we have tutoring every single day after school even Fridays we have our teachers are available well our teachers are available when they're available because <laughs> all of the students need help um, we just have just tutoring. Tutoring is such a big part of my life in high school, especially I'd say junior year. That algebra two, whew. <laughs> algebra two was a struggle. And uh, you can ask, I was in tutoring with Miss Allen, my algebra two teacher. I was in tutoring with um, a teacher that taught calculus, but I needed to get a different teaching style, so I went to him for, for academic help. Um, Banneker just they're like, you're going to college, and they're like, we're going to help you get into college. So, yeah, they're very adamant <laughs> on getting us into college. Now, it's a little bit different, not just in my school, but schools that are around us, is they're not exactly pushing go to college for four years and get a degree. See, we have like a tech program, and so our administrators and principals and teachers kind of push some students in that direction to go to tech school and learn a specific skill. 
And for example, there's a student that I was actually friends with and he went to school, I think it was for uh, plumbing or uh, something else, and he came right out of high school and he's making $80,000 a year. So, I mean, we kind of see that it's, we need both. We need students that need to go to college for four years and get a degree, but we also need students that need to get those skills that we need to do those other jobs. Yeah, I th it's interesting. Um, I guess I'll continue to stand so I have a mic to talk and, and engage with you guys, but you have different pathways to where you are. You're, you're also in different places in your education. Uh, David's in his second year in college. Our other two students are transitioning and getting ready to go to college. So they've, they've, they're on both, uh, both sides of a, an important life transition. So I'd be curious to hear from you, um, maybe starting with you, David, given that you have a couple of years under your belt now at Georgetown, um, what was in place for you to help you get there? And what was needed once you arrived to help you stay and succeed? At George, <clears throat> at George, I did a program called Community Scholars. And it's, it's essentially a program where you get to come for about six weeks. Uh, you get two classes under your belt, you know, college courses. That, that was pretty neat. Uh, saves you money. <laughs> um, and yeah, so with that program, like I said, you come for six weeks and you know, you just get to, you know, learn the campus and you meet different like faculty members. So in being in a program like that and you know, already having two classes under my belt and then by the time I got to campus, you know, I, I just felt very comfortable because I, I knew how the campus looked. You know, I knew where the cafeteria was. I didn't have to look for my dorm. You know, I, I knew a lot of the faculty members. So that, that program, you know, did, it, it helped out a lot. Yeah, we often, uh, people who talk about this process often um, frame it as sending supports. What does the sending institution have in place to help students make that successful transition to college and then receiving supports? If you have it on one end and not the other, it tends not to be as effective as if you have that support on both sides of the transition. Um, Either Lexi or Austin, as you're thinking about the transition um, through high school and into college, what supports are you drawing on in the school now to help you with that, with that move? Um, support to get to college. Honestly, we have, at Banneker, we have Alumni Day where uh, students as young as the class that just graduated and students that graduated in like 19, <coughs> you know, they come back. <laughs> <laughs> they, they come back and tell us how much Banneker prepared them for college. Like um, everybody from the class of 2014 has literally come back this week. I think they're on like fall break, but they've come back this week and they're telling us, College is so easy. Like Banneker is is the highest form of education you will get because college is so easy once you get there. We know how to write, you know, 20 page um, thesis papers. We know how to not procrastinate and procrastinating is a skill you have to learn not to acquire. But, uh, <laughs> but just the alumni always come back and tell us how easy the skills they learned at how easy college is because of the skills we practice at Banneker. And so it's encouraging to me as a senior because right now I feel like like a duck. You know, I'm, I'm pretty up here, but my feet underwater are kicking, you know, with the college applications. But I think it's reassuring to know that my friends that have graduated are coming back and telling me that the schools that I'm interested in are actually easy, not well easy, but they're just not struggling, you know. In, in terms of their transition in their freshman year in college, so it's encouraging to know. I think we can we can assume a sense of humor will be a coping strategy Lexi will use to <laughs> to get through the stressors of college. Austin, at my school, the teachers are the ones that are really supporting myself and the other students. I mean, we only have two guidance counselors at my school, which has about a thousand students. So I mean, that's kind of hard, and. Uh, we, the teachers there are always just finding ways to talk to the students and I, every day I get a question, how's college looking, have you applied yet, have you got your essays done? And I think that teachers, whenever they drop it down to a personal level, that's the most supportive way. It's almost like they're being a, a parent to us as students. So, so, so you feel like you're a, 
being reached out to as a real person, mm -hmm. not just a student transitioning to, to college. Exactly. Yeah. We, have, um, we hear that from students all the time. If they feel understood by the people in their learning environment, they feel like they have more to offer and, and uh, more motivated to contribute. Um, let, let me frame the next question this way. You have all these people who you have an opportunity to deliver a message to. Uh, part of what we're talking about at the conference is the role of student voice, you know, how important that is. Mm -hmm. You have a voice here at this conference. What, what are a couple of key messages you would like to deliver to this room of educators? I think students excel whenever they have a choice. Mm -hmm. Whenever teachers produce an opportunity for a kid to show that he or she has learned something without them having a multiple choice test in front of them or writing an essay. I believe that whenever a student is able to go in, for example, in my 10th grade English class, my, we read a novel and my teacher said, show me that you understood this novel. And that's really all he said. There was a girl who came back and she played a four minute song on her flute that basically told the whole story and it was insane like it I, I couldn't believe it happened how she did it there's another girl who created a poster using the iPhone emojis with like the smiley face here then it got real sad and then a fire happened like it was she got it and he she showed it and it was something completely outside the box and then myself I mean I I enjoy writing and excel in writing so I just wrote an essay or a story about it and it really showed who got the novel and who didn't. And it also helped students really try hard and work on the project. Otherwise, if they said, okay, you need to do it this way, some students would be like, oh, I'm not really good at that. So this gave them all the opportunity to do something they were good at and show that they learned it in their own way. Mm -hmm. mm, fantastic. Lexi or David, do you want to chime in? Okay. Um, yes, piggybacking onto what Austin said about choice, it's everything. Um, me, personally, as a student, I'm like a butterfly. Like, I need freedom. Um, <laughs> I, I work best through poetry. I'm an artist. And there, for example, there's a scholarship uh, for DC, uh, DC CAP. And we're supposed to write an essay, a rap, or a poem about why we want to go to college. And my mom, my mom was like, uh, so you're getting this essay, right? you're, you're getting the scholarship, right? Because if I'm allowed to write a poem about why I want to go to college, I'm going to write the best poem I can because poetry is my passion. College is what I want to do. That's how, you know, that's how I want to further my education. So with that, given that choice, I'm going to excel. I'm going to achieve. So I, I definitely think that choice is everything when it comes to educating your students. Mm. Great. <laughs> David. Um, I guess I would tell students, uh, one of my teachers I remember doing the college counseling process, they told me, David, you like to do what's easy, you need to do what's hard. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would tell students do what's hard because you know it's like lifting weights. You don't lift your you don't lift your body weight. You lift what's a little bit higher than you. And when you lift that, you get stronger. If you do what's easy, you're not you're not gonna get anywhere. You need to do you need to do what's hard because anything in life that's worth it is not gonna be easy. So when they're transitioning to college, you know I would tell them don't settle. If you see an opportunity, you know that you know you have to challenge yourself in. Like me going to Georgetown, I know going to Georgetown, I'm lifting weights every day with my brain. It's, it's hard, so you know, do what's hard, don't do what's easy. What, what would you say to teachers who encounter students who don't want to do the mental weightlifting you're talking about? I'm thinking about my middle school son right now, by the way, <laughs> and, and, and taking notes on this. Um, how can teachers help students push through? Um, you used the word, uh, Lexi used the word procrastination earlier, something I specialize in <laughs> to a degree. Um, we all, we all have, uh, feel limited in different ways at different times. How can educators help students push a little beyond that and get to where you, know, you folks are going? 
I mean, I think that they could help, um, like, Lexi, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Lexi said, like, you know, she's motivated through, like, you know, the music, like poetry and stuff. So I feel like you have to find what that student is motivated in. Like, I also like music. So if a teacher tells me, like, yo, do a project on music, I'm, I'm going to do my best on that because that, that's what I love. So you, you have to find, connect with them, like Austin said, on a personal level first and find, you know, what, they're, what they really like, what they're about. And then after you connect on that personal level and, you know, find their talents and gifts, you find, like, some way to correlate it to the classroom to keep them excited and keep them engaged. Fantastic. Yeah. How about uh, you, Austin and Lexi? Uh, recommendations for how to help students push through their limits? I say definitely don't give up on them and mm -hmm. don't let them quit. Mm -hmm. one, thing, one thing my principal has been saying is, there's parents that call in and say, hey, can you take my son or daughter out of this class? Mm -hmm. And he strongly believes that they, they need to stay in that struggle and find a way to push through it because if they do go to college, it, they can't, I mean, they can quit, but that'll be costing them a lot of money. <laughs> so, I mean, we do believe that it's better to challenge yourself than to just give up on that challenge. And when students see that teachers are interested in helping them and helping them get through it and push through it, it makes them actually want to get through it instead of just quitting. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So this achievement is really, uh, again, you're, it's back to a team effort. Mm -hmm. When you feel the teacher really understands who you are, you feel more motivated to, to persist. Yep. Lexi. Um, I had the opportunity to cover the Raise Up Project at the Kennedy Center. And basically the Raise Up Project um, talks about the high rate of high school dropout and not furthering your education for different reasons. And I guess the, one of the main themes was how to keep our students engaged, how to keep them motivated, and how to keep them from dropping out and from checking out. And I think when a, a really big problem is when teachers see that their students are checking out, they start to think, oh, well, let me not waste my time, and they check out on the student. So I really, I, back to going on a personal level, I think like teaching conventionally, like just educating at your students is not, it, it's out the window. Like we need to get on the same, on the same playing field level with your students, really try to, it's all about perception. You know, try to see things from where they're, they're coming from. Um, take their background into consideration. I know that the teachers can't be in the homes, but sometimes when you understand what's going on at home or what's going on outside of the classroom, it definitely affects what's happening inside the classroom. Fantastic. Let me, let me follow, up with, uh, follow up with that. One of the things that um, new teachers or, or people who are training to be teachers um, often say is, well, I understand that it's important to get to know your students and to build some sort of connection, but I have, uh, I have anywhere from um, 100 to 150 students a day. I can't get to know all of them, can I? So can educators get to know all their students? Is that, is that a realistic goal for us? How do you, how do you see that sort of um, reaction from some new teachers? There's uh, 180 days in the school year, so. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, it's not the easiest job. I mean, you guys have to deal with, there's the good apples and there's the bad apples, but there is time to find something to connect with every single student. You see them every single day. You don't have to focus on one student or two students. You can talk to them all. I mean, just try to connect with them. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. How about, how about you, Lexi? Uh, like Austin said, there are pl there's plenty of time throughout the school day to get to know your students. And we're not saying, you know, know everything, but, you know, be their best friend. But definitely get an idea of what interests them, uh, what their passion is, what they Try, what they shy away from. What they shy away from is what you should be pushing at them because, you know, cl clams don't just produce pearls because they don't struggle to, you know, to like that little piece of sand, right? Pearls are made of sand, right? They don't, they don't just like sit there and they're like, oh, I'm not going to struggle with this. They, they struggle with that piece of sand and then it's a pearl. Like, yeah, you should definitely know your students. <laughs> 
So be, be with them in the struggle. Yes. Make pearls. <laughs> be with them. There you go. David, anything you want to add to that? I mean, you guys pretty much uh, summed it up well. Yeah, it, there, there is time. You know, I, I do see that as a, I guess, like, valid reason. You know, there are a lot of students, but I feel like with, with some students, like, you can connect with all of them, but with some students, you have to connect even more. Of course, you're not going to have to, you know, go outside with all of them, but with some of them, you do. But not with all of them, but you should try to connect at least, like, you know, like a, a little icebreaker, you know, mm -hmm. where are you from? Like, what do you like to do? And, I don't know, maybe hold like some hours after school for them just to talk to you. Not just about academics, you know, what's going on socially. Because I feel like part of being a teacher is not just, you know, teaching, it's also being a mentor. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a lot of students, at least for me, like coming into high school, like I didn't, I didn't really have mentors. Like I didn't even think about college. But, you know, having teachers that went outside of their way to connect with all of us really helped and it you know when you connect with them you know some students it makes them you know come to you like after I saw my teachers you know made a point to connect with everybody I stepped outside of my bounds because they stepped outside of their bounds and you know we created good relationship that's incredible I mean Think about, uh, think about the journey of coming into high school with no thought of college, feeling like you have no mentors, and now being a second year student at um, Georgetown coming from the city of Chicago. That's a big trip, and uh, takes a lot of work on the student's part, <laughs> literally. <laughs> in Washington, D.C. can be a trip in and of itself. Um, let me ask you one more thing, and then I'd be great to get some questions from, from the audience for our panel. But Lexi mentioned, um, to quote a famous educator up here, I need freedom. Right? She said, I need freedom. I'm the kind of person who needs freedom. I have to be able to choose. And at the same time, you said your school is so highly structured, you have no choice but to go to college. Um, if I didn't go to college, I'm not sure what would happen to me. So how do you, how do you um, blend the need for structure and support and the need for freedom. Any, any ideas about any Any of the panelists can talk about that? The need for structure could, because you've all talked about having, um, when we talked about this yesterday at the, at the uh, convening, there are the notion of infrastructure. You have to have mm -hmm. things in place to help you get to where you want to go. And uh, the Banneker School, for example, has a lot of infrastructure for getting yes. to college. Yes. So they give you a lot of guidance, but at the same time, students do want freedom. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about that relationship between the need for support and the need for freedom? Well, now I kind of understand why I couldn't answer that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I do have the freedom at my school. Like we. When we, we had a conference call earlier this month and we kind of talked about our classes and our school mm -hmm. and Lexi told me that she was given her schedule and she really could only pick one class. And that was just kind of like, oh, like really? <laughs> like I get to pick every single one of my classes and our school makes it work for us. We say we want this, this and this and they say, okay, you have it this time, this time, and this time. And I think that's really, beneficial to me because I can pick what it's almost like I'm going in the direction that I want to in high school instead of waiting until college mm -hmm. so I can take my business classes now instead of having to take all the core classes so. fantastic Lexi David mm -hmm. like Austin said at the beginning of the school year well last year we were able to test into our AP classes I tested into three and on my schedule this year, I only have one. And the discrepancy was that on, uh, the classes were only offered at certain times and in relation to everybody else's schedule, you had to pick which one was most important out of three. So I picked AP Literature because words are my thing. Um, <laughs> and it was kind of like, I, I had to drop um, AP US government and yes, and, another class I can't it's not even on my schedule I can't remember but um it was 
it's more like you have to pick and choose what you really want. And I know in life you can't always get everything you want and you do have to make those decisions to you know, weigh one option over the other. And I think, I, um, even though I was kind of given you know, which one do you want, it, I wish I could get all three. I wish I could have gotten the two, the most important two that I wanted. And um, Banneker is structured to get you into college and they give you your classes. It's because they know what you're going to excel in. I w wish I didn't have to compromise. Like Austin, he gets to pick everything he wants, so he knows he's interested in all the classes that he's taking. And it's kind of like I was given an ultimatum. So in terms of just giving students a choice, um, I, you want them to choose everything, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, right. I had eight classes and I had trouble picking all of them. Like, I wish I had more. So <laughs> just think about what she has to go through. <laughs> we'll make more for you, <laughs> David. <laughs> I think the, the student voice uh, comes into play a lot because I had a, a similar background to Lexi. I went to uh, All Mills Charter School in Chicago. It was pretty much, you know, when you come in the door, you know this school is gonna get me into college. Like, I'm going to college to graduate. We had to have, I think probably like two, two or three college acceptances. We couldn't even graduate mm -hmm. without the, uh, a college acceptance into a four-year university. If you didn't have that, you know, you pretty, if you weren't on board with that, you pretty much had to transfer. Mm -hmm. And I think the student voice comes into play when you, you know, you let students tell you like, you're not, you're not doing this right into getting us into college. I think we should look you know, more into this. And as students at my school, we did that. I was a part of uh, the Student Government Association. And, you know, we put a lot of things together and uh, actually, like, sat with the principal and, you know, went over, like, okay, I think we should have this event. And then you have to realize, like, when you do have it set up like that, like, okay, you're going to college, you can stipulate that, but you can't, I guess, like, set boundaries within that. You can't say, all right, you're going to college, you're gonna do it this way. Mm -hmm. They have free will to, you know, to, to get that. You have to, you know, let students create their own path. Like for me, I had to create my own path. All my friends, we all created our own different paths. So even though like we were, I guess like um, inbound, even, even though like we, you know, they set that stipulation for us, we could go about it in different ways. So that's great because so many um, new college students get lost after the high structure in some cases of high school mm -hmm. and the relative freedom of college. Mm -hmm. If they don't have the experience <laughs> to make tough decisions, they can really get lost in that process. I got real lost. Um, why don't we open it up? Uh, you have a, a great panel of um, advisors, respondents, questions for, for the panel from the audience. We have a microphone coming around. First of all, to all three of you, all you uh, awesome. It's great to hear each one of you speak, and you should be very proud of where you're at and where you're going. And if any of the three of you want to further your education or come work in Kentucky, uh, we'll find a place for you. Uh, There's but a stop I, at the University of Pennsylvania first. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to direct this to Austin, but all three uh, students can certainly uh, respond. But Austin. Uh, when you were introduced, uh, you were introduced as a four-sport athlete. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about extracurriculars and how that's impacted your success in school. Tell us what you play and what positions, all because I'd love to hear that. But also tell us how that's uh, impacted you as a student. <laughs> that's yeah, really good question because I wrestle so and I cut a lot of weight the past couple of years. So I mean, that's a struggle being tired all the time and having classes and all that. I also, uh, I play baseball, shortstop. The kid who actually played in front of me last year got a full ride to Virginia Tech. So I mean, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, w I played my first year of soccer this year and I was a forward and a captain, so I enjoyed that. I mean, that was fun. And I also kick for the football team. So I have a lot going on and I'm also one of the co-leaders of my student section. So, I mean, I have game, I've had games four nights a week, and I'm going, that other night, I'm going to see my classmates play and still trying to balance these other classes, you know? So one thing that's really 
convenient at my school is we have an hour and a half for classes. So, I mean, I can get my homework done in school. I have the time to do everything. And if I don't, some teachers are very accepting and they understand how much I have on my plate at the time, if you know what I mean. So, the t I say to you guys as teachers to really get to know your students, as I've been saying, because you, unless you know them, you don't really understand what's going on with them behind the scenes at home. They could have some really bad problems going on or they could be dealing with like wrestling and losing weight all the time and not eating and playing sports and just doing everything and getting involved. So, I mean, one more thing that I think is very important is to find the leaders in your schools and fi tell them to get the students who are just sitting around, who aren't going above and beyond, the students that aren't going out to the football games, the students that aren't mm -hmm. joining clubs in SCA. I think it's important to find those leaders and tell them to pass down their powers, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> because especially at my school this year, we've been really trying to preach to these kids that to get involved because it's not, they're missing out. I mean, I'm having so much fun my senior year. I'm, I love watching all my classmates play sports and I go to school every day and I have fun in my classes. So really just try to make school fun for your students. Austin, just a follow-up question to that. When you, um, as a leader in your school, reaching out to the students who aren't doing as much, do you find that it's effective? Can you be effective with them? To some, yes. I mean, we try to have meetings for our student section in specifics, and we're trying to just get these younger kids who are scared to, you know, go out and be with these upperclassmen, and we're just trying to find ways for them to be comfortable. And something that we implemented last year in our school, we called it advisory. Mm -hmm. And that's a class where for a half hour a week, we have roughly 25% freshmen, sophomores, juniors and seniors, they all go into one classroom, the same classroom every week with their advisor teacher, and they just converse and try to build character, leadership, scholarship, and service. So it's, it's a way to kind of build all of that and then also help connect your lower classmen with your upper classmen and try to get them involved in doing more things. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be looking for a school reform plan from you shortly. <laughs> um, Le Lexi or David, do you want to add to that, uh, to touch on the role of extracurriculars mm -hmm. in your school life? Um, all of my extracurricular, extracurricular activities have nothing to do with school because uh, my mom has always told me you're one person in school and then you have to be well-rounded everywhere else too. I write and model for Love Girls magazine. I just came last night from hosting the Love Awards 2014 and I was honored with the editorial mm -hmm. award. Um, what else? I am in Fresh, females representing every side of hip hop. Through them, I got to perform at the Atlas, at the ARC, at the Kennedy Center. I studied dance for 13 years. I got to perform at Martha's Vineyard. Um, I, what else? I do poetry with words, beats, and life. I've, I've, <laughs> my, extracurricular, my extracurriculars are everywhere. Um, at school, I'm an amnesty club. I was on the journalism club last year. I perform at the assemblies. It's, it's all over the place. <laughs> um, I just think that extracurriculars is just a big part of who you are as a, as a student. And um, it's just, it plays into homework, because then you gotta find time to do your homework, and you gotta find time to study, and then you know still get that 3.5, so <laughs> it, it's all that. But um, I think, oh, also being a leader, you don't, no, no knocks, no knocks. But um, Austin is a leader in his school. I am a leader in my community, if that makes sense. I don't necessarily have a title of leadership at my school, but I definitely <coughs> recruit girls to write for the magazine. I definitely recruit girls to come to Fresh, to be a part of that sisterhood, to have enriching experiences outside of school, inside of school, encourage girls to you know, perform on stage, to don't, not be scared about you know, what people are gonna tell you or how they're gonna react to you. So I think that being a leader in the community and in school is, yeah, do it. Mm -hmm. I'm developing an inferiority complex just being around me. Yeah, I gotta get to work. Uh, D David, anything you wanna add? Uh, yeah, I do think that extracurricular activities, they definitely do help out. I think extracurricular activities add 
they, you know, they're supposed to be out outside of school. Like they connect the outside with the inside and they help mm -hmm. you like, uh, you know, become well-rounded as a student like me. I did um, track and field, cross country. So, uh, and I had like the same coach for both. And my coach, um, he actually played, you know, a very important role academically. Like for for our team, we we had to keep at least like a 2.5. He came to me and he said like, yo, you know, you're smarter than that. You got to keep a 3.0 to stay on this team. Nice. Um, <laughs> What else did I do? I did National National Honor Society. Nice. Uh, that was also very enriching. Uh, helped me out overall. I got to, you know, tutor students in math, science, and you know, like just connect with people. Uh, also did poetry. Mm -hmm. That helped me out a lot. I, you know, like performing and stuff. I like music. I did the step team. Uh, grew up in the church. My mom was a minister, as a deacon. Um, I don't know, I, I sang in the choir. So I don't know, I, I, it definitely does help out. Like I said, it connects the outside with, with that inside. And it, it just makes school funnier if that can happen somehow. <laughs> I think that's so well said, connecting the outside with the inside. Um, there were another question, yeah. Um, so, so I want to ask this question about ed reform. And uh, I think I'll frame it this way. Um, you know, David, you're from Chicago. Uh, a lot of stuff going on in Chicago in public schools, you know, a mayor who is very contentious, uh, school closures, opening charter schools. I guess you had a charter school experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Alexa, you were in elementary school probably when uh, you had a superintendent here in Washington, D.C. that was, um, you know, very contentious, very controversial, you know, sort of in your face with educators. Um, you know, Austin. Uh, I don't know where Greenberg Salem High School is. I don't know if it's near Philadelphia, but Philadelphia's you know really uh, struggling these days. Um, it, you know around the question of you know what should public education look like. How does all that controversy and sort of drama um, you know among educators and in, in their communities? How does that affect you in your learning and how you think about schooling? Anybody who wants to take a shot? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if you've noticed it. I'm very the theatrical, so <laughs> I, I take well to drama. Um, I've <laughs> and, uh, um, my mom always keeps me focused. Always. Uh, my village, higher achievement, my mentors outside of higher achievement have always <coughs> kept me focused. So whatever the school was doing, if the school or the administration didn't have their act together, my mom was like, college. My mentors are like, you're going to the best college for you, you know. Um, no matter what's going on up top, you have to keep your focus. You have to know what you want. You have to set your short-term goals, your long-term goals, your ultimate goal. Um, as long as you're always working towards what you want to aspire to, no, nothing else can phase you. For the sake of time, how about we take another question? That was a, a, a great comprehensive answer. Yeah. I'm sorry, we got a mic right here. Okay. Sorry. I'll move around here so you can see me. Oh. About right here. Okay. Um, Thinking about your situation at your high schools um, and, and when you were there, uh, David, as well, if there were any concerns that you had, did you feel like there was opportunity to express your concerns or voice your opinions? And what mechanisms were there for you to be able to share that student voice? For me personally, we have a student voice, like where <coughs> there's selected students that we take in and we don't just take the leaders in, we take students that really don't do much because they also want to hear their thoughts. So there's student voice and a lot of the time it's just the teachers that are coming to me and asking me like, what do I need help in? What do I, what are you doing? What are you up to? So as we've said. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to respond to that question? Um. You, you make your own voice, you have your own voice. Uh, 
you have the right to exercise it, you have the right to not exercise it. Me personally, I go to my teacher's door at lunch, take my, take my bag lunch, and I go to my math teacher, I go to my guidance counselor, ask her about application fee waivers, ask her, did you send my transcript yet? You know, I'm trying to get into, so I, I make sure that you hear me, that you see me, and you, you know my name. If I, saw you if I saw you coming, I'd get busy. <laughs> All right, David, you want to add anything? Or? Um, I mean, yeah, like, like they both said, the, the student voice does help out a lot. I know at my school we had uh, parent meetings where they talked about us, and then we had student meetings where we talked about us, and uh, the principal, he supervised it. Uh, he took down notes, and I also know that um, the SGA, the Student Government Association, that we had at our school, um, that played a big part in student voice, like, you know, who we voted for, like not just voting for our friends, like voting for somebody that was actually gonna like stand up for us and make a change. Like um, we voted for one of my friends, but um, <laughs> we like actually like were, were able to like voice our opinions on the school lunch, cause you know, it was pretty, yeah, but we were, we were able to change it. So, you know, just, just small things like that. Right. Uh, other questions? Yeah, does someone have a mic we can bring over? I got the mic first. I'm standing up quickly. Okay, there you go. Um, I, first, I want to say um, I've really enjoyed actually the past two conferences that I've been to. There's been student panels, which as a board member is really important. Um, so pay attention, Superintendent Evans. Um, I want to, I've, I've actually quote, I've tweeted Austin today. You said something that was really important for me is that students excel when they have choice. Um, and I have a comment and then I do have a question for you all. Um, I know one thing that we're doing and I'm really talking to my superintendent on the side here because I really want a student voice at the board level. I want someone to make sure that we're on point as adults making decisions about your education, but you having that voice. And so hearing that for me just continues to reiterate that, and I will continue to take that back and say, how dare we make policy and decisions about the future of education without having students at the table? Mm -hmm. That's my comment. My question is, your junior, seniors, and sophomore in college, if you could go back to your freshman and junior year, what would you do differently, and how would you do it? Myself, personally, I, I probably would have focused a little bit more. I mean, I did struggle because I don't think I was ready for it, honestly, because I was playing sports, and I was more focused on that and then kind of being accepted by everyone, trying to be, like, the cool kid, you know. So there was all that going on, and I was struggling my classes, and I don't think as a freshman I was getting as involved with my teachers as much. I mean, the teachers didn't know me as well, and they didn't, I don't think, pursued to get to know me more. So I think one thing I would have done more is got more in touch with my teachers, because when I was struggling, I don't think I really asked for help for anyone. And I thought, I, I really didn't, because I didn't, I didn't want to show anyone that I was struggling. That's really why. I didn't want to show my weaknesses, so. And uh, also a comment. Uh, you, do you have students on your school board? Is that what you don't? See, uh, our class president, he's on, he's over there, Zach. He, is on, he sits on our school board, so he sits in on those meetings. So, I mean, if that's an option for you guys, it tends to work pretty well for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> study, 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 study. Uh, I developed my, st my great studying habits junior and senior year. Uh, Self-advocate. You are your first best self-advocate and then your mother is your best self-advocate. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're getting your mom so bad. <laughs> um, yes, I think going back to the whole fitting in, like in my freshman year I was like, oh, I wanna be a cheerleader and I'm gonna be a cheerleader. And I should have been, you know, a cheerleader in math, you know, like. <laughs> um, yeah, just, I think it's kind of like coming into yourself. I think that always, that happens in high school as you get, you know, towards your upperclassmen years. And it's kind of like your first year, you're struggling to fit in. You're struggling to come out, you know, out of the eighth grade. You're the, you're the top dog in eighth grade. But then 
you're at the bottom of the, of the food chain in ninth grade, so it's all of those factors into one study. And another thing that my school does, we have a senior mentoring program mm -hmm. where we have some seniors that are the leaders and that sign up for this and they can go in and they talk to a group of freshmen once every couple days. And it just may, makes the freshmen say like, oh, I can, I'm close with this senior. I, I feel comfortable with this senior. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna talk to the senior if I have a question. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I definitely would, uh, going back to my freshman year, like they both said, I would focus less on the social aspect because, you know, I, I thought a lot or paid a lot of attention to, you know, what my peers thought about me and didn't really, like, focus on my teachers to the extent that I should have. And also on the same lines of Austin, uh, coming, you know, from, from eighth grade, like, I always had a, a, a problem, you know, back then, like, asking for help. I, I was afraid to, you know, tell my teachers, like, yo, I'm, I'm struggling in math, like, can you help me? So just, just stepping up, I, I would have stepped up a little bit more academically and uh, getting, like how we've been talking about getting you guys to know us on a personal level. I also feel like it's important for us to know you guys on a personal level. So, you know, I maybe would have tried to do that as well too my freshman year. That's a great point. The importance of teachers being known to their students as well as teachers knowing their students. Yep. One thing that I do wish I could change about my school, and I mean, you might back me up on this too, is I need that freedom and more time. Like if I just had a half hour to kind of talk to my, t because after school I have my sporting events, and then mornings, I mean, I'm not there early enough, which I could, but teachers are busy, you know, teachers have stuff going on. And I just wish I could have a half hour in the day, like an enrichment period where I could go in and I could finish a college application, I could get my teacher to fill out a letter of recommendation. And if not that, I could just sit, I wish I could just sit down and read for a half hour because, I mean, I, I fall asleep reading all the time just because it's just like the day's so long. So I wish I did have a little bit more time or just a free period. And I forget what the second one was. <laughs> How could you help those students who, who aren't doing as well? To, I, as we've been saying, is to really connect with them and find ways to give them opportunities that students like us are really getting. I mean, I'm so grateful for being able to go and be, be able to present things and be able to speak in front of, I mean, I went into school one day, so there was no school, it was in service. And I went into school, I don't, they got me to do it. <laughs> and I mean, I presented that EMAPS thing to all the teachers and it's just some kids have like do nothing, anything near that. And I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely hard to find ways for students who aren't involved to do that, but it's really just, you need to get them involved in something, find something that they like, tell them to join some sort of club, tell them to get out and go to a football game or do a sporting event. It's just getting them to express themselves in the way that they want to. Mm. Yep. Um, I remember the second part, but not the first. Oh, time. Yes. At Banneker, everything is. We have assignments that are due, uh, assigned Monday, then due Friday, but then we have a lot of assignments that are assigned Monday, due Tuesday. And it's like a lot in every class. And it's a, we have extracurriculars, and then when you get home, 
be like, okay, I need to shower, I need to eat, I need to do my homework, and then you're up till one, and then you're like, okay, but then I still need to study, so then on the bus or in the car, you're trying to go through your flashcards. So it's kind of like 24 hours aren't enough if you really want to be the best student and the best person you can be all at the same time. So I wish that, um, we have advisories on some, we have advisory schedules some days, but some, I do wish that we had an hour or a half hour to just knock out a whole entire homework assignment, you know, not just start it and then finish it at home or, you know, um, what else? Oh, successful. Um, honestly, I've always had the mindset, this is what I want to do, these are the steps and that I have to complete to get there. Not every student is wired like that. Not every uh, teenager is wired like that. Um, students that cannot self-motivate, I guess, teach them skills to self-motivate. So you can motivate them because everybody needs somebody in their corner. It's, it's just what it is. You need somebody in your corner. You also need to teach them skills how to self-motivate because when you get to college, you, um, David is blessed with you know his own team of supporters and mentors, but in on bigger camp at bigger campuses, uh, say Wisconsin, they have like forty thousand uh, uh, plus right at their at their campus. They they might have some people who students who are independent who are they self motivate, they self advocate, they do things for themselves. So I think it's important to have a team. Well, yeah, my theme is teamwork, but I also think that it's important to teach our students that success comes through doing it yourself. You have to know what is, you have to know what you want to do and you have to know how to get there by asking for it for yourself, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Okay. If I could, I, I guess I, I would change the uh, discrepancies uh, in my school in terms of the education and in terms of, I guess, the funding, because I did see, I, I guess it goes to a larger, like, uh, political issue. I did see, you know, the community, like I came from in a community that my school was in, you know, the, the worst community um, in Chicago, number one for gun violence. We, you know, really didn't get that much funding in terms of, you know, books, uh, laptops and stuff like that. But yet I noticed my friends that went to suburban schools, you know, they had Macs and they books were new and, you know, that definitely does play into uh, your experience as a student, what you're given. So I, I would change that. And then in terms of uh, success as a student, I think as a student, you have to realize that you're not good at everything, but you are good at something. And you have to take that something that you're good at, uh, your niche, and then build mm -hmm. your weaknesses around that niche and strengthen them. So would you say, David, um, kind of in connection to the question about how to help students who are struggling more, not quite as successful, find, find out what they're, they might be good at and help them develop that, help them find their niche? Yeah, they have to realize, like me, like, I, I like English. I could write a pretty decent essay. Um, but for another student, he, you know, he or she might not like English. He or she might like math. So they could you know, take math okay, I'm good at math, and the, the way I do it is, okay, I, I like things like English and philosophy. I apply that to life as a whole, and you know, I, I apply it to math, like, okay, I'm not good at math, I hate math, but how does English and philosophy or music tie into it? So, you know, that's what I meant by like, you taking that niche and like, you know, strengthen it, strengthen your weaknesses through it. I hope to hear those words come out of the mouths of my kids someday. I like things like English and philosophy. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, do we have time for one more question? Right here. Uh, right here. We do. Yep. Okay. First of all, I want to thank you for your perspective. I want you to know that your voice drives our actions. So we thank you. So. <laughs> So for one last question, this is a pretty big question. Can you tell us the good, the bad, and the ugly of parent involvement? <laughs> and how it's affected you and your schools as learners? Remember, your parents might be in the room. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we let him start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the good. Um, in terms of parenting, it does help out um, 
if you do have a parent in your corner, although having a mentor is, or, you know, a good group of supporters is pretty good. It's nothing like, you know, having that, that good role model in the home because it, it starts at the home first. Like me, I um, didn't have my dad, but I had my mom. And, you know, her, it, it was good, like, her participating in my college process. Like, you know, even though she didn't go to Georgetown, you know, quote unquote, you know, uh, really good school, really prestigious. Um, just seeing how um, she still valued education. And, you know, so my mom being a mentor first, and then my other mentors coming second, that helped out. Um, the bad, I can say that um, sometimes parents can get too involved <laughs> in your educational experience, and um, it, it can, you know, make your experience bad as a whole. Um, so, like, as we've been talking about uh, thus far, like, that freedom, that freedom. So being involved as a parent, but it, not being too involved and letting your child kind of, um, you know, make tough decisions, not not on their own, but you know, at least like leading them and then allowing them to to make that decision. Mm, fantastic, Lexi or Austin. Um, my mom is the definition of an active parent. Every parent-teacher meeting, every performance, every everything. Every everything. I, call, I like to call her my momager. She is... <laughs> you <laughs> you want to talk to me? Get through her first. <laughs> um, she, she, she came from a single parent home uh, where my grandmother didn't speak any English and she got herself into high school and into college. So she had to self-advocate. So she has definitely taught me the importance of self-advocating -advoc and she has advocated for me. So through every decision I make, mom is like, these are your options, weigh them out, list your pros and your cons, and that's literally how we tackle everything. And then she also goes, you know, I have more experience than you, so I know how this plays out, but I'll give you, you know, a little bit of leeway, and then you'll see that I was right, so. <laughs> <laughs> But your, your oh. parents are definitely, oh, don't start crying. Your parents are definitely, definitely important. Um, you know, and not everything can be smiles and giggles. You know, it's very, Alexia, did you complete that? And it's like, yeah, mom, I did, you know. Um, but they're definitely everything in um, the involvement in education and life and just everything. So have your parents. Excellent. Lexi's uh, mom introduced Lexi to me today, I believe. <laughs> she, she was here at the door. So what's good for me is, I mean, I got kind of lucky that both my parents, they went to college four years and got, well, mm -hmm. my dad went a couple more years. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I had to. I'm sorry. <laughs> so... I mean, that's good for me, but for some students, both their parents might not have gone to college, and some, might, some neither of their parents have gone to college, so th their parents don't know. And what's even worse is if they don't know to go to the guidance counselor and say, hey, how do I get into college, then, <laughs> like, what are they going to do? Because there are students that just kind of float through high school, and then they're just stuck at the end, and they're like, uh well, I guess I'm gonna go get a job at McDonald's or something, mm -hmm. which, which is bad. I mean, they're going and putting all, these effort, all this effort in school and they're not using it. They're trying to further their education. But, I mean, it's just important for teachers to find out those things and to find out what, if kids have the education at home from their parents, if they have that push, if they have that knowledge, and it's important for the teachers to direct the students that don't have that knowledge in the right direction. Fantastic. Could the um, parents and mentors of our panelists stand up for a moment? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, she was back there. She's 
so much. And Dad, I'm sure those two extra years of college did you a lot of good by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice pretty, much, pretty much reaching the end of our time. As we, um, as we move to wrap up, could we have one more hand for our panelists? Oh.